Kazushi Sakuraba is one of MMA's most beloved icons. You would be hard pressed to find a fighter who has the unanimous love of everybody who has seen him, both in his native Japan and overseas, and it's fairly easy to understand why. Outside of any ability Sakuraba had, he is an infectious and charismatic personality. You can't help but smile and laugh when you're around him. When people talk about him, it's almost never a negative mourning of his professional lows, but a fond remembrance of his highs. With how much fun it is to talk about Sakuraba as a personality, it can be pretty easy to forget that he is also one of MMA's most important fighters as well. With an incalculable number of classic moments in his career, Sakuraba's name is synonymous with the aura of Japanese MMA, with one fight standing in its own stratosphere of importance, not only to the sport of MMA, but to culture itself. On May 1st, 2000, Kazushi Sakuraba and Hoist Gracie entered the ring. The stage was Pride Fighting Championships the largest mixed martial arts organization in the world, but the rules of their fight couldn't be further from mixed martial arts. Sure, they're fighting in an MMA ring, wearing MMA gloves, and whoever wins will have it reflected on their MMA record, but on this night, Hoist Gracie and Kazushi Sakuraba are slotted for a fight to the death. What brought us here? Why should we care about this one fight on this one day in this one organization? What is it that makes this fight and the men involved in it so special? To understand what makes this fight so important, we have to turn back the clocks. No, further than that. Further than that, even. You're getting warmer, but even further. You know what? This would probably be easier if you let me handle it. The story of Kazushi Sakuraba and Hoist Gracie is so much more than just them. It's the story of identities and egos a century old, a constantly evolving understanding of societies and cultures, and ultimately the story of martial arts itself. And to understand them, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Martial arts have been being innovated and refined long before documented history. The roots of just about every martial art reside in the human nature to fight to survive being honed through an understanding of the human body, with each school of thought across the world having a differing perspective in how best to bend the bodies of attackers in order to break them. In many places in the world, martial arts would become a core part of their culture, but if there's one nation that is known for their acceptance of martial arts into their society, it is unquestionably Japan. When most people think of Japan, some of the earliest images that can be conjured are ancient warriors existing in legends, such as samurai or ninjas. But when you look into history, you'll see that the Japanese samurai were a high-ranking class of military in Japanese culture. Researching the ebbs and flow of roles that the samurai have taken across the history of Japan is fascinating in its own right. But what's important to this story is that these soldiers were well-trained in many classes of weapons. But in order to defend themselves, should they be in a battle without a weapon? they were trained in an art known as jujitsu. Broken down to its literal meaning, jujitsu means gentle art, focusing on throws and holds to incapacitate enemies by way of manipulating an opponent's force against themselves. Jujitsu was designed to assist the samurai in all military endeavors, but in feudal Japan, many of the secrets of jujitsu were held sacred, only to be learned by those in the high class of society, such as the samurai. Eventually, these secrets began to spread to the populace, with many people creating their own substyles of jujitsu that specialized in different things. But by the mid 1800s, nobody understood the stagnation of jujitsu more than Kano Jigoro. Kano was born into a sake brewing family in Mikage, Japan, and even into his adolescence, was very small, attracting a large amount of bullying. To counteract this, Kano fell in love with jujitsu, as some of the core principles of the art emphasizes that smaller men can manipulate a battle against a bigger man's strength in order to best them. Not just looking to get good at kicking people's asses, Kano wanted to learn as much as he could. Kano sought doctors who knew martial arts as they understood the human body more than most. He sought teachers who practiced different styles, and when he struggled in sparring against his peers, he would research outside elements to incorporate into his jiu-jitsu, such as sumo or western wrestling. By the 1880s, Kano Jigoro had become a teacher himself, but like those before him, 
The style he was teaching wasn't entirely dissimilar from what had been taught to him in the past. The truth was that jujitsu just didn't have a lot of places to go. This would change when Kano Jigoro started sparring with his old teacher, Ikubo Sunatoshi. Sunatoshi was a master of Kitoryu, a style of jujitsu that specialized in throwing techniques, but as they began to spar more frequently, Kano was able to best Sunatoshi with regularity, implementing techniques that break the posture of Sunatoshi before attempting his throws, making them impossible to defend. When he told Sunatoshi this simple idea, that throws should be applied after one has broken his opponent's posture, Sunatoshi told him that there was simply nothing more he had to teach him. This implementation of outside techniques was what defined Kano Jigoro's approach to martial arts, as from there he sought to redefine jiu-jitsu with different influences. Incorporating elements from traditional Japanese martial arts as well as the West, Kano Jigoro would go on to create his own system, called the Jikishin Ryu, or as it would come to be more widely known, Judo. Kano Jigoro's Judo would become a staple of Japanese education, with the art being implemented into the Japanese curriculum in the early 1900s. Where jiu-jitsu was originally a secret hidden in the higher levels of Japan's caste system, judo was being spread to children at a young age. And while judo would become more and more important in Japan, the great advances of the art would come in the 20th century, as Japan began to open their books to the world. It may be hard to understand in the modern era where everything is more connected than ever, but the history of Japan is one that is tied together by secrecy. Throughout much of their history, Japan was closed off to the world, which led to their societal and cultural beliefs being in that of Japanese supremacy. It's probably pretty easy to think that you're the best when you're never exposed to anything else that could make you think otherwise. But in Japan, there has always been a dominant perspective that they are really great, and people acknowledging their culture is a form of validation because their culture is great. There was a light controversy in 2013 where Katy Perry performed at the American Music Awards in a Japanese kimono with a set clearly decked out in Japanese imagery. Cherry blossoms, fan dancers, rice paper screens, all very surface level Japanese aesthetics. There were some people who got upset, saying that Katy Perry was appropriating Japanese culture. But a common thing to rebuke these complaints was that there was a video of someone who got the reaction of a random sample of Japanese people in response to Katy Perry's performance, where they all adored it because she wouldn't do so if she didn't love Japanese culture. This may seem like a strange point to bring up, but I use it as a pop culture pinpoint in relative history to illustrate that the perspective of Japan as they become a more open country is that if they could show their culture to people, it would win the hearts and minds of the world because Japan is incredible. To this end, Japanese martial artists began touring the world in the early 1900s, doing demonstrations of their formerly secret martial arts for people who would come far and wide to see the mysterious Eastern men and their ability to throw each other on their heads. This is spread all over the world, but for the purposes of our story, we join a student of Kano Jigoro named Mitsuyo Maeda as he tours Brazil in the 1910s. Now, there is an entire culture of Japanese-born nationalized Brazilians that I could go into, but Suffice it to say that Japanese influence had a pretty big foothold in Brazil. And when Maeda began doing his judo demonstrations as part of a traveling circus, it must have resonated with a lot of young men in Brazil. One of these men was 14-year-old Carlos Gracie, who watched a demonstration by Maeda at the De Paz Theater in Belém in 1917. Carlos was the son of Gastão Gracie, who was affiliated with the circus that Maeda was touring with. And when Carlos became enamored with Maeda and the art of judo, Maeda chose to train Carlos as a thanks to Gastel for helping him spread his mastery. After all, what would be a better way to pay it forward than to directly teach the Japanese martial art to a group of young Brazilian men? Maeda would train Carlos, who would take those techniques back to his family, innovating and adapting the art with his own understanding alongside his brother Elio. And whether Maeda intended to or not, he gave the tools to young Carlos and Elio Gracie to begin building the foundation of one of the most recognized martial arts in modern history, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or as it was known at the time, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, was an adaptation of Judo and traditional Jiu-Jitsu that was honed by the Gracie family in the 1920s. Sure, Carlos and Elio had been given tools by Maeda to implement judo, but in the hand of hot-headed kids, the art of judo was adapted into a system that emphasized practical self-defense. Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was honed not in dojos, but in combat, 
with the Gracies becoming innovators in organizing fights and traveling circuses where they would display their mastery of grappling against all comers. These fights became notorious in Brazil, being called Vale Tudo, or Anything Goes, in which the Gracies would fight anybody who believed that they could best them in fights with no rules and no time limits. Eventually, this began to transform as the martial art had itself. See, the Gracies' core tenants were best utilized against those who had no idea how to defend the techniques. And since the Gracies essentially invented Brazilian jiu-jitsu using a pretty private training relationship with Mitsuyo Maeda, not only did very few people have a chance against them, but those who did soon found out that the core of the Gracie style was mind-numbing length. The Gracies had developed a style that was used to quickly incapacitate unready opponents, but also completely nullify those who understood grappling arts, turning their fights into wars of attrition. One example of this is in 1932, when Elio Gracie faced Freddie Bear. Ibear outweighed Elio by nearly 70 pounds and was a decorated freestyle wrestler. But with the lack of a time limit, the grappling match lasted over two hours, eventually being stopped by police as neither of the fighters were progressing or advancing position. This style was incredibly effective against nearly anybody who was willing to fight them, with the Gracies and their traveling Valet Tudo Circus becoming the home for what was dubbed the Gracie Challenge, an open invitation to anybody and everybody to meet them under their rules. The Gracie Challenge became most notable for events like Elio vs. Ibear, matches between the elite of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and other disciplines. While the Gracies were creating an empire in Brazil off the back of Maeda's Judo teachings, Japan was thrust into the world lens. The cultural hallmark that saw Japan spread their martial arts knowledge to the world also culminated in much more traditional ways, such as conquering lands and waging wars against those who could threaten them. This isn't to condemn Japan, as if conquering unsuspecting lands and committing atrocities is uniquely something that was done by them, or that the people's belief in Japanese superiority was somehow fueling a war machine bent on global domination. But it's an important part of the equation. While the world wasn't connected like it was today, the Gracie family and their success in Valet Tudo being built off of Judo teachings is unquestionable validation for the societal beliefs that Japan held so strongly. Their culture was indomitable. Their way of thinking, their way of living, their art, their beliefs, their everything was superior to the world around them. In the 1930s, Japan would join forces with the Axis powers of World War II, allying themselves with Nazi Germany and the Kingdom of Italy. Not because they shared similar ideological principles, but because they all had common enemies, those who would prevent each of them from invading and conquering to their heart's content. For Japan's side, they began to invade much of Eastern Asia and islands in the Pacific Ocean. In 1941, this was brought to a head when Japan attacked the United States naval base at Pearl Harbor. The United States were the allies of Great Britain and Russia as the Allied powers, but the United States hadn't officially joined World War II. Despite that, as Japan conquered islands in the Pacific Ocean, they drifted closer to Hawaii, deciding to attack the naval base to prevent the United States from interfering. Of course, this only dragged America into the conflict, and in 1945, the United States infamously retaliated to Japan's previous act of aggression in the form of the deployment of atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing approximately 226,000 Japanese citizens and wiping two major cities off the map. It is, to this day, the only use of nuclear weapons in armed combat and officially brought an end to World War II as Japan signed terms of unconditional surrender shortly afterwards. To understand why this was such an important sidebar, I want to play a clip of another video that references this, M. Lemon's video about Stanislav Petrov and the power of nuclear weapons. During the Second World War, Japanese military procedures were heavily based on the Bushido Code, a traditional Japanese tenant which focused on the ideal of the honorable death. Two of the most infamous tactics used by the Japanese military were the merciless war crimes committed against POWs and the kamikaze. Both of these methods stemmed from Bushido, which dictated no greater honor than to die for the emperor, and no greater humiliation than to surrender to your enemy. For generations, Every soldier in the Japanese army was trained under the belief that if you surrendered to your enemy, you forfeited all of your honor, and you no longer deserved basic human dignity. The Japanese feared surrender more than death itself, and they would sooner commit suicide than submit to their foes in combat. The thoughts and hopes of all America, indeed of all the civilized world, are centered tonight on the battleship Missouri. <laughs> 
There, on that small piece of American soil, anchored in Tokyo Harbor, the Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. They have signed terms of unconditional surrender. In 1945, Japan had not only been physically wounded by an eternal scar in the form of the nuclear attacks, but their national identity had been irreparably shattered. What was once a belief that Japan was superior to all of the world had to be adjusted. If they were so superior, why were the people in Nagasaki and Hiroshima not spared? If they were so superior, why did they surrender? While the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima were atrocities in themselves, the lasting effect that the surrender brought was much greater. Cities can be rebuilt and people can be mourned and remembered. But imagine you're an average man in Japan in 1945. Your national identity is so intrinsically tied to pride so great that you would rather die than surrender. And while Nagasaki and Hiroshima were tragedies, you were raised to believe that the Japanese are the strongest in all of the world. When Japan's surrender came and the United States occupied Japan for much of the next decade, you cannot help but feel dehumanized and humiliated as your nation surrenders to outside forces and your entire life begins to fundamentally change. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed a lot more than the 226,000 Japanese citizens. And while Japan would be rebuilt, it would come from a source that they wouldn't expect. After World War II, the United States would occupy Japan, bringing with them a complete restructuring of Japanese government and culture. Where Japan's pride was built around their culture being their own, the post-war occupation saw a rapid advancement in the westernization of Japan, with their entertainment and economic outlook heavily influenced by the western soldiers occupying the nation. While it would be an exaggeration to say that post-war occupation brought national belief to an all-time low, as I can't speak for the average Japanese citizen in 1945, but this complete reshaping of a sovereign nation into the country we can see today took an effect on the populace as a whole. People who drew pride from being Japanese just couldn't find pride in that, and they had to find that boost elsewhere. Fortunately for them, the same westernization that had destroyed their worldview would also be one of the sources of rebuilding. Japan's economic rebuild post-World War II was so dramatic that it has since been dubbed the Japanese Economic Miracle, where Japan's industrious advancements and connections with the outside world rapidly developed them into the world's second largest economy. Much of the Japanese media that people readily identify today, such as Godzilla and anime, were innovated during this era, heavily inspired by the Western influence permeating the cultural zeitgeist. But there is an argument to be made that few tools of societal rebuild were as important as professional wrestling. While pro wrestling was not the source of Japan's economic boom, nor will it be written about in textbooks, the work that professional wrestling did in Japan is inseparable from its history. Sumo wrestler Mitsuhiro Momoda, better known as Ricky Dozen, brought wrestling from the West to the East, recognizing an opening in society for the kind of catharsis that wrestling can bring. Ricky Dozen saw that Japan was empty. The old martial arts were intrinsically tied to an era that they could no longer find pride in. And as American influence began to permeate Japan, the chance for Japanese supremacy to be shown through professional wrestling couldn't have been more perfect. During the 1950s, Ricky Dozen would become Japan's greatest star in professional wrestling, promoting matches where he would represent Japan against foreign invaders, doing battle against them and their cheating ways and coming out on top. What goes even deeper in these matches is that Ricky Dozen would often be humiliated by these foreign wrestlers, but through an overwhelming sense of pride and desire, he would always come out on top. It sounds silly when it's laid out so simply. Sure, professional wrestling is fake, and make no mistake about it, people knew it was fake back then as well. But the connection that can be made with people, the fire that burns inside of you and the person you identify with is shown to be victorious, nothing could be more real than that. When someone who saw their entire way of life be irreparably changed went to a pro wrestling show headlined by Ricky Dozen, they saw a Japanese competitor dueling with a foreign invader. The foreigner would cheat his way to gaining an advantage over Ricky Dozen, humiliating the star that they came to see. And just when you would believe that those dirty tricks would beat him, Ricky Dozen would snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, proving that the heart of Japan still beat strong in the face of oppression through the medium of professional wrestling. Is it silly? Maybe but there's no question that it was real. While the 1950s was the decade of Ricky Dozen in Japan, one of the most significant events in the story happens across the world in 1951, 
The same year that Ricky Dozen began working as a pro wrestler, esteemed judoka Masahiko Kimura traveled the world with a pro wrestling troupe. Accompanied by fellow judokas Toshio Yamaguchi and Yukio Kato, the three would follow in the footsteps of Mitsuya Maeda before them, traveling the world and demonstrating the strength of judo. But with the advent of professional wrestling in the West, they would apply their skill sets to these contests to much fanfare. This would change when Kimura and his group made their way to Brazil and were challenged by none other than Elio Gracie. For almost 20 years, Elio Gracie carried the torch of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu into the Valle Tudo circle, challenging any and all comers to partake in the now famous Gracie Challenge. But in 1937, Elio retired from competition, remaining retired until 1950, where he pretty much picked up where he left off. When Kimura and his troop came to Brazil, Elio was goaded into challenging them in a pretty fascinating story that is ultimately irrelevant to the grander story at play, with Elio being matched up across from Yukio Kato, the least experienced of the three judokas. According to accounts, the match was mostly controlled by Kato due to his superiority with throwing techniques, but the mats being used were too soft to do damage with them, with the match ultimately going to a time limit draw. Unsatisfied with the result, Elio and Kato had a rematch with no time limit, and after half an hour of fighting, Elio overcame domination once again to secure a choke that forced Kimura to throw in the towel. Despite the controversial nature of the matches, the loss damaged the perception of the Japanese troop, as they were being promoted as the strongest martial artists in all the land, and one of them had just lost, with the Gracies openly mocking them to add insult to injury, famously dragging a coffin through the streets to symbolize their fallen opponent. Gracie would next challenge Yamaguchi, who was above Kato in experience but still below Kimura, but Kimura accepted the challenge instead, setting up a fight for October 1951 between himself and Elio Gracie. The fight between them is perhaps the most famous Valle Tudo match of all time, with Kimura entering the match as the much larger man, estimated to have a weight advantage of 20 to 30 pounds, which was common for the Gracies. Remember, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and the Judo it was based on was entirely built around the ability to beat larger opponents. But Elio was also experienced at blitzing boxers or pro wrestlers who didn't have any clue what these techniques were. That wouldn't be the case with Masahiko Kimura, considered to be one of the greatest judo practitioners of all time, only losing an alleged four matches in his lifetime. When he met Elio Gracie, this prodigious ability was reportedly on full display as Kimura dominated the smaller Brazilian, throwing him repeatedly and getting top position with ease. For his part, Elio focused on the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu specialty of stalling. While this fight had a time limit, Elio's tactic of wrapping up his experienced opponents and slowly wearing them down until an opportunity presented itself was tried and true. This wouldn't happen with Masahiko Kimura, though, as Kimura dominated the fight with relative ease. Through 13 minutes, Kimura was reportedly never in a bad spot before locking in a deep submission. The name of it depends on which discipline you practice. In Judo, the move is called the Udegrami, in catch wrestling, it's called the double wrist lock. But in modern-day Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it is known simply as the Kimura. When the hold was locked in, Elio Gracie famously refused to tap, choosing to die with his pride rather than surrender to fight another day. And Masahiko Kimura obliged, snapping his arm and forcing Elio's corner to throw in the towel, signifying the end of the match and the first true decisive loss in Elio Gracie's fighting career. While Japanese observers rushed the ring to toss Kimura in the air, a symbol of celebration from Japan, it's difficult to separate this victory from Ricky Dozen's efforts in Japan in 1951 to establish professional wrestling as a means of rebuilding the esteem of a nation. On opposite sides of the world, Japanese strength in martial arts was on display at a time where it was needed more than ever. And while Ricky Dozen and Masahiko Kimura have a dark and violent history together in their own right, the two of them changed the course of history in Japanese martial arts. Things would never be the same after 1951. Japan's economy had experienced a miracle rebuild. The westernization of culture was being turned into a positive rather than an oppressive negative. And the strength of both the old era and the new were being developed through the victories of Masahiko Kimura and Ricky Dozen. Ricky Dozen's establishment of pro wrestling in Japan elevated him to superstardom, and when it came time for him to pass his knowledge down, he certainly wasn't stingy. Of the students that Ricky Dozen took in as part of the Japanese Wrestling Association, or JWA for short, 
The most notable are Kanji, Antonio, Inoki, and Shohei, Giant, Baba. The two would rise to stardom of their own in JWA, but paled in comparison to the legendary Ricky Dozen. Things would change following Ricky Dozen's death in 1963, with Inoki and Baba carrying on the legacy of the JWA, but both of them leaving in the early 1970s for vastly differing reasons. The similarities between Inoki and Baba were pretty much stopped at where they started wrestling and who they trained under. Giant Baba was a lot less aggressively ambitious than Antonio Inoki, exhibited first by simply not renewing his contract in 1972 with the JWA while Antonio Inoki was fired for attempting a hostile takeover of the company. Further than that, the two had extremely different views of how the sport of professional wrestling was to be practiced, which was best exhibited by the promotions they created once leaving the JWA. For his part, Giant Baba worked to create a relationship with America's National Wrestling Association, or NWA, looking to lend his All Japan Pro Wrestling promotion as a Japanese wrestling territory for the legendary NWA brand with all of the trappings that this created. All Japan leaned heavier on foreign wrestlers in southern wrestling style violent matches exhibited by Abdullah the Butcher or Bruiser Brody. Antonio Inoki, on the other hand, viewed pro wrestling as an extension of martial arts. During his time in the JWA dojo, Inoki was trained by catch wrestling god Carl Gotch and clearly took this inspiration to heart as he developed his own style of pro wrestling. Inoki's style modernized the old days of Masahiko Kimura's traveling pro wrestling troupe, merging the utilization of legitimate holds and approaches with the showmanship of professional wrestling that the sport had drifted away from by the early 1970s. Inoki and Baba's styles of wrestling were both incredibly popular, with Baba's All Japan and Inoki's New Japan maintaining massive success for decades to come. But while Baba's All Japan was arguably more successful than Inoki's New Japan due to its bigger emphasis on foreign star power, Antonio Inoki quickly outpaced his peer as the biggest pro wrestling attraction in the country. This would build into one of the most influential moments in Japanese sports history in 1976, when Antonio Inoki was set to have a fight with boxing's world heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali. Ali really needs next to no introduction, as he was already the greatest boxer to have ever lived. But to give a placement in time for his fight with Inoki, Ali had won the World Heavyweight Championship for a second time after beating George Foreman in 1974 and the legendary Rumble in the Jungle, and in 1975 would have his third climactic fight with career rival Joe Frazier in Manila. It's probably not an exaggeration to say that outside of Ali's notorious exile from professional boxing, Ali had never been more of a prominent public figure. So when he clashed with Antonio Inoki, it was one of the biggest events in sports. Now, I'm not going to give a blow-by-blow -blow breakdown of the fight because it's something that has been incredibly well documented by greater minds and better researchers than myself, and for the purposes of the story, the actual happenings of the match aren't super important right now. But following the infamous draw between Inoki and Ali in 1976, something changed. It wouldn't manifest itself for many years, but the match between Inoki and Ali being a taste of professional wrestling as a martial art clearly left a mark on the culture of Japanese wrestling especially under Antonio Inoki. In 1984, eight years after Inoki faced Ali, there was an exodus of wrestlers from New Japan Pro Wrestling. Like Ricky Dozen before him, Antonio Inoki had trained dozens of wrestlers, many of whom would become legendary in their own right. But, like Inoki himself, there were many of them who had ambitions beyond being another piece in the NJPW puzzle. Chief among these were Akira Maeda, Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Nobuhiko Takada, and Satoru Sayama who were the main driving force behind the direction of this new promotion, the Universal Wrestling Federation. The UWF in 1984 was most known for their innovations in what would become known as shoot style, a logical progression from Inoki's strong style that emphasized even more realism in the application of techniques. Where Inoki's strong style would utilize catch wrestling holds occasionally, there is an unmistakable flashiness that Inoki and the New Japan style brought compared to the more gritty application of someone like Yoshiaki Fujiwara's application of similar holds. While the results were still predetermined, the emphasis on looking and feeling more realistic was groundbreaking for professional wrestling. So much so that ancillary wrestlers who helped break ground for UWF in Russia Kimura, Ryuma Go, and Gran Hamada would leave the company and join All Japan because the radical shift wasn't what they signed up for. UWF met an untimely end very early in its inception, following a breakdown between Akira Maeda and Satoru Sayama in 1985. Accounts on what happened in the build-up differ from Maeda was power-hungry and a hard-to-work-with dickhead, and Satoru Sayama was an egotistical maniac who booked UWF only for himself. 
But regardless of what the motivations were, Maeda and Sayama's ability to stand one another clearly broke down in the ring. This came to a head in September 1985, when Maeda finally ended a brutal match between the two by legitimately kicking Sayama in the groin, ending the match by disqualification. Maeda was fired by UWF, Sayama left wrestling altogether, and the promotion dissolved with the roster returning to New Japan. After a couple years, though, the allure of restarting UWF proved too great, with much of the same roster, minus Sayama, once again leaving New Japan in 1988 to reform the company, this time with even more additions, such as Yoji Anjo, Masakatsu Funaki, and Minoru Suzuki. The 1988 rendition of UWF is the most historically significant one, as this iteration of the company and the style that they practiced influenced pro wrestling in Japan as a whole to change their entire approach to the art form. Prior to UWF's success, both New Japan and All Japan leaned heavily on disqualifications and weak finishes that protected the wrestlers and their reputations. But UWF refused to play the same game, instead leaning on clean finishes as if the contests were sport. And when they were wildly successful doing this, both All Japan and New Japan slowly but surely transitioned into the same with the reputation of Japanese wrestling being closer to sports than its American counterparts being integral to its appeal to this day. For as legendary as the 1988 rendition of the UWF was, though, it was equally short-lived, burning out due to a combination of economic downturn and the vision of Akira Maeda being decidedly insular. What is important, however, are the sprawling changes that happened as a direct result of the collapse of UWF in 1990. The core group of wrestlers mentioned before would split in three separate directions. Akira Maeda, now persona non grata in New Japan, would create Fighting Network Rings, a shoot-style organization that forewent the billing of wrestling entirely, cultivating a massively successful group of talent such as Volkan and Kiyoshi Tamura. Fujiwara, Funaki, and Suzuki formed pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi, an organization that focused on shoot style but was far more open to incorporating different elements into the medium such as using more foreign wrestlers as talents instead of attractions. Incorporating American talent can shamrock heavily. The company we are going to be following the most, though, was formed by Nobuhiko Takata and Yoji Anjo, which would continue the namesake and vision of the UWF with their promotion, the Union of Professional Wrestling Force International, more commonly known today as UWFI. Nobuhiko Takata, for those who don't know him, is one of the weirdest cases in pro wrestling. In a lot of ways, Takata took a lot from his trainer Antonio Inoki, which could be seen in how Takata was presented in UWFI. As the top star of the promotion, Takata portrayed the handsome hero who overcame all obstacles due to a deep technical mastery of combat. But when you talk to people about Nobuhiko Takata, there is still a lot of contempt for the man, even strictly in pro wrestling fan spaces. A lot of this can be traced back to the early days of UWFI where Nobuhiko Takata wasn't afraid to come off as kind of corny in the pursuit of promotion. In 1992, Takata enlisted the services of pro wrestling legend Lou Thez as a kind of legitimacy boost for the company, utilizing Thez's old title as the main belt for the company, labeling it as the Real Pro Wrestling World Heavyweight Championship. And if you're like me, you'll notice the unmistakable term real being front and center. Now, the optimistic people out there may read that as simply as saying that this championship, because of its history with Luthez, is the most prestigious championship available. So to claim that you are wrestling's greatest heavyweight champion, you have to hold this belt, basically using real as a synonym for legitimate. But when it comes to pro wrestling, there is no way to escape real being an antonym for the eternal foil of professional wrestling discourse, fake. Nobuhiko Takata was something of a notorious mark for himself meaning that he believed his hype just as much as anyone else did. And in promoting UWFI and their more legitimate style of wrestling, he would insult and deride other promotions and their champions as fake wrestling, challenging many of them to have a match in UWFI where they could prove that they were real by facing him, a real pro wrestler. It is extremely corny and stupid, and trust me, very few people got a kick out of this when it came to wrestlers outside of UWFI. But as it pertains to fan reception, it was unquestionably successful. UWFI built massively from its inception in 1991 through 1993, with Nobuhiko Takata as its major champion throwing out grandstand challenges to anyone who gained notoriety. And since nobody in Japan wanted to work with him, it was pretty easy to claim that they were all scared of him, the real pro wrestling world champion. In 1993, UWFI would be broken big when Takata's challenge was answered by legendary American wrestler Vader, 
with the two having a match in December in front of a reported 46,000 fans that saw Nobuhiko Takada trump the legend by submission, legitimizing his claim as the real world champion. While Nobuhiko Takada was now one of pro wrestling's greatest stars and the owner of one of the most successful pro wrestling companies in the world, the seas were about to become a lot rougher for him. Because as much as he could deride wrestlers in New Japan and All Japan for being less real than him, this only works as a way to promote yourself as long as nobody can ever claim to be more real. In 1993 was when reality began to crawl from out of the primordial ooze. On both sides of the world, the origins of mixed martial arts began in 1993. In Japan, while Takata's UWFI was thriving, pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi was struggling, but had stumbled onto something fascinating. While promoting the shoot style of wrestling, the stories of Ken Shamrock the gym legend began to creep up, with legends of how Ken Shamrock would dominate other wrestlers in contests away from prying eyes. This came to a head in 1992 when Fujiwara Gumi would run an experiment that hadn't been seen yet in Japanese wrestling, a legitimate contest between Ken Shamrock and Don Nakaya Nielsen. While incidents like Sayama and Maeda going off script and attacking each other aren't uncommon in the history of Japanese wrestling, the idea of promoting legitimate contests was almost taboo. Remember, the appeal of professional wrestling is that it is cathartic release and entertainment beyond regular sports. So if professional wrestling contests were to suddenly be legitimate, why would people watch it over more culturally established sports like sumo or kickboxing? This was the common perception in wrestling in 1992. But when the fight between Shamrock and Nielsen drew very well, the ambitious upstarts Masakatsu Funaki and Minoru Suzuki got to thinking. Their thoughts would manifest itself in September 1993, when alongside Ken Shamrock, they created Pancrase, a hybrid of professional wrestling and legitimate combat where the fights would be real. The first event was massively successful, which validated the creation. And while it wouldn't be as successful as Takata vs. Vader in UWFI months later, the foundation was set domestically for problems to arise with the perception of Nobuhiko Takada being anything more than a successful pro wrestler. It wouldn't just be pressured domestically though, as in America, another group had a case of parallel thinking to Funaki and Suzuki. What if fights were held legitimately and broadcast to people who had never seen anything like it? Surely this would be a money-making phenomenon, but who would benefit from this? Who could be forwarding the brand of combat in North America? Oh, I should have known. You Gracies always did love to play the long game. After Elio Gracie's defeat in 1951, he seemed to mourn his loss by having several children. There are only four of Elio's nine children we really care about for this story, and we'll get to them shortly. But outside of Elio's proficiency for leaving it in, what the Gracies really excelled at in the modern age was marketing. The Gracie family had begun to experience a resurgence in popularity globally, but especially in America, due to a series of VHS tapes titled Gracie's in Action, a release of footage that documented the history of the Gracie Challenge, popularizing the Valley Chudo origins of the family amidst martial arts fans. This came to a head in the early 90s, when Hori and Gracie, the eldest of Elio's sons, joined forces with California businessman Art Davey to create a pay-per-view event that sought to modernize the Gracie Challenge. In what was tentatively titled War of the Worlds, the theory behind the event would see a single elimination tournament of fighters from different disciplines of martial arts to determine which was truly the strongest. This can be presented as a noble goal, but Horian's goal was slightly different. The Gracies knew that many of the competitors would not understand what their jujitsu was, so they needed to present a figure that could represent the brand but wouldn't overshadow the infomercial to sell their combat system to the audience. The candidates came down to Elio's three remaining important sons, Hoyler, Hickson, and Hoyce. Hoyler was potentially the most technically proficient, but was also by far the smallest. Hickson was the great champion of the family, with a reputation that preceded him in Valley Tudo fights dating back to 1980. But his size and stature was deemed to be too imposing and could harm the acceptance of jiu-jitsu as a universal combat system, which only left the youngest of the group, Hoyce. Hoyce was smaller than Hickson, but bigger than Hoyler had more grit than Hoyler, but less experience than Hickson, which made him the logical everyman plant in the event. In November 1993, 
The event that was conceptualized as War of the Worlds, but would be broadcast to the world as the Ultimate Fighting Championship, went off like it was a script from a movie. Hoist Gracie bested all of his opponents with relative ease to win the tournament, proving the effectiveness of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu to be paramount and launching the Gracie family back into public acclaim. You might be wondering what these events have to do with Nobuhiko Takada and the UWFI. And sure, these events had nothing to do with Nobuhiko Takada's UWFI on paper, as the stadium match with Vader took place after both Pancras and the UFC had happened. But the realness of combat that both companies put on being so popular meant that they would have to continue into 1994, which presented a lot of problems for Nobuhiko Takada and the suddenly much less real UWFI. For the UWFI, 1994 was a strange year. While the rise in popularity of Pancrase and the UFC continuing into the year might have cast a shadow over UWFI, the company was still able to sell out the famed Budokan Hall with regularity. But as Nobuhiko Takada lost the championship to Vader in a rematch, and Vader went out to feud with Gary Albright in a foreigner versus foreigner headline act, the sequence of events that would take place would present an unsolvable problem for the future. First, with Vader and Albright feuding, it left Takada with nothing to do. And if Nobuhiko Takada is nothing else, he is a resourceful promoter. MMA was on the rise in 1994. With Pancrase running a famously successful tournament to crown a champion, the UFC hosting three more tournaments with Hoist Gracie winning two of them, and Hicks and Gracie participating in Shudo's Valet Tudo Japan tournament and winning. Nobuhiko Takada saw and understood this, and went back to what garnered him so much success in 1992. He posed a grandstand challenge to Hicks and Gracie to come to the UWFI and fight him. Now, calling people out to fight is one of those no-lose scenarios for Takata. Should anyone accept, they are going to have to go to Takata's wrestling company where he is the biggest draw, and in order to partake in the money that was going around, you were going to lose to him, which ultimately makes him look better. But in the more common case of people refusing or ignoring the call-out, it doubles as a promotional tool for Takata as he can claim that the person he was calling out was just too scared to accept the challenge. However, Hicks and Gracie is not exactly one of those people. No, Hicks and Gracie refused Takata's challenge, and his reason for it was twofold. First, Hickson had nothing to gain by working with Takata. He was succeeding in Shudo with the Valley Tudo Japan tournament, and, once again, was the greatest champion of the Gracie family. What would he have to gain from working with Nobuhiko Takata? The second is a bit more complicated to parse out, as Hickson's aversion to working with a pro wrestler can be understood on the surface, but it's a bit more than that. See, Hickson didn't want to do a wrestling match with Takata because it would look bad for the fighter image that the Gracies had cultivated. If he did a wrestling match and looked quote-unquote weak, people would view the best fighter of the Gracies as less of a fighter. But even if he did have assurances that he would beat Takata, even if he would make him look good, there is also the outside possibility of Takata going into business for himself. The history of Japanese pro wrestling is littered with its greatest stars taking liberties with opponents in order to promote themselves. Ricky Dozen had a match with Masahiko Kimura where he chopped Kimura's neck so badly that he was knocked out and Ricky Dozen never granted him a rematch. Antonio Inoki allegedly went back on an agreement between himself and Muhammad Ali that the two would simply play along with each other en route to a decision, with Inoki diving and kicking Muhammad Ali's legs so frequently that Ali's legs reportedly sustained lasting damage. Takata himself had risen to stardom in UWFI by shooting on multiple opponents. He faced boxer Trevor Burbick and kicked him in the legs, which Burbick alleges were illegal as per their initial agreement and left the ring, which left Takata as the winner via forfeit. In another famous incident, Takata faced sumo wrestler Koji Katao, who was notoriously difficult to work with and refused to lose. But Takata shot on him and threw a legitimate roundhouse kick to the face, which knocked him out. The story of Japanese pro wrestling is littered with its top stars taking liberties with their contemporaries. So even if Hicks and Gracie was willing to play ball with the wrestler in a wrestling match, it would be inadvisable for him to do so as one stray kick from Takata could shatter the Gracie's mystique forever. So for his part, Hicks and Gracie rebuked the challenge, and unlike the wrestling opponents, Takata couldn't just say that Hickson was too much of a coward to fight him, but that didn't stop his friends. I briefly mentioned him earlier, but Yoji Anjo is a player in the UWFI under Nobuhiko Takata. He's not a main eventer, but his reputation in the UWFI dojo is that of a tough wrestler who is playing his part of the company. And maybe he believed that status a bit too much because Anjo did one of the dumbest things that anybody could ever do. He flew to America to storm Hicks and Gracie's dojo and challenge him to a fight. Dojo storming has a pretty deep history in its own right in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. One of jiu-jitsu's most famous stories in its formative years was when jiu-jitsu students marched across Rio de Janeiro to a Luta Livre gym to have a fight. 
And when Yoji Anjo flew across the world to storm Hickson's dojo, it would also become one of the most famous stories, but for all the wrong reasons. What makes it even more important are the legends surrounding it. They say that when Anjo got to the dojo, Hickson wasn't there, and Yoji Anjo began bragging and boasting that Hickson heard he was coming and fled. But one of the students called Hickson, who wrapped his hands in the car on the way to answer Anjo's challenge. What took place when Hickson got there either wasn't filmed or has never been publicly released. But there are two things that are confirmed by multiple parties. Hickson Gracie fought Yoji Anjo, and Yoji Anjo got the shit kicked out of him. What's more, a famous photo of Yoji Anjo's bloodied and battered face following the fight with Hickson would be published in Japanese newspapers, which was an abject disaster for Takata and the UWFI. Takata was now put in an awkward position. He couldn't call Hicks and Gracie for a fight in his wrestling organization, as the precedent had been set that he could fly to California and avenge Anjo's bludgeoning. But Takata knew what everybody was starting to realize. He couldn't fight. Takata had been trained in some martial arts and was a good athlete, but he wasn't a fighter. He wasn't Masakatsu Funaki or Ken Shamrock, guys who adapted their catch wrestling prowess to legitimate fights. He was still just a wrestler who was all of a sudden exposed as a fraud amidst an already massive rise in popularity of MMA to contrast the product UWFI put out. Takata's reputation was absolutely shattered, and when he tried to salvage it in 1995 by working with rival promotion New Japan Pro Wrestling, it backfired like the callout of Hickson had. While the UWFI invasion angle of New Japan was financially successful, New Japan booker Ricky Choshu held a lot of resentment for Takata after the comments in the early 90s about New Japan's legitimacy. And when Takata came crawling to him to work together, Choshu let that resentment out in the form of a complete embarrassment of UWFI, save for a token world championship win thrown to Takata, who had seemingly sold out his company for the chance to become New Japan's heavyweight champion. In just two years, Takata had gone from the most popular wrestler in Japan to a joke. His reputation was built in reality. But after Yoji Anjo's beatdown at the hands of Hicks and Gracie and the failed invasion of New Japan, it was clear that he wasn't the greatest martial artist. He was just a con artist. UWFI closed their doors at the end of 1996. And while much of the roster went on to create another shoot-style organization called Kingdom, it never reached the highs that UWFI did. What Kingdom lacked, however, was Nobuhiko Takata, who didn't follow his former colleagues onto another organization. No, Takata was at rock bottom and was forced to face the proverbial music. In 1997, Takata was contacted by promoters KRS, who had concocted a novel idea. An attempt at redemption for him in a mixed martial arts bout against Hicks and Gracie in front of a sold-out Tokyo Dome audience. Having nothing left to defend, Nobuhiko Takata accepted the bout for October 11th. The fight wasn't for a world championship. It wasn't for money, and it wasn't for fame. Nobuhiko Takata would fight for his pride. Nineteen ninety seven is possibly the most important year in mixed martial arts history, as well as the beginning of its economic downturn. You wouldn't know that by watching Pride, though, as the fight between Nobuhiko Takata and Hicks and Gracie drew a sellout crowd to the Tokyo Dome in what was the largest MMA show ever many times over. While being massively successful, the show was also objectively terrible. Bronco Sikatich, former K1 World Grand Prix champion, faced Ralph White in a kickboxing contest, which ended in an awkward and sluggish no contest after a minute and 52 seconds. Enzo Gracie and Akira Shoji fought in an entertaining but impossibly long 30 minutes to a draw. Not to be outdone by the impossibly boring Kimo vs. Dan Severn fight also going to a draw, but none was more stinky than Takata vs. Hickson. Sure, the fight didn't last 30 minutes, but it also lacked any kind of spirited performance from Nobuhiko Takata, who went out there and performed about as pitifully as people could have feared when he didn't fight Hickson in 1995. In an effort to shoot Takata some bail, Takata was on the wrong side of 35 and was in the ring with one of the most experienced Valley Tudo fighters in the world. But this bail goes away when you remember that Takata called this man out to fight in the past, and even though it was three years later, you don't just forget these things. Ricky Choshu didn't forget the things that Takata said about him, and the people didn't forget that Takata called on Hickson to fight. And now that he finally got that fight, he looked absolutely pitiful. Though the show was successful enough to warrant a return in 1998, it was clear that Nobuhiko Takata as an attraction was completely spent. Nobody cared about him anymore because he wasn't good at the thing he was meant to be good at. Because of this, Pride would go on to struggle pretty significantly without a major star, which is mirrored on the other side of the world in the UFC's 1997, which is a nightmare in its own right. In an effort to avoid MMA being outright banned in America, 
the UFC started to change their structure in 1997, implementing weight classes, mandating gloves and uniform rules, and generally trying to make the sport more professional. But due to lobbying from United States senators, the UFC was banned from major American sports markets, holding events exclusively in southern states and outside of America. In December 1997, the UFC would debut in Japan with one of its strongest cards ever, featuring the crowning of a new middleweight champion, a heavyweight championship bout, and a one-night four-man tournament. In order to appeal to the Japanese audience, the UFC worked with UWFI's successor, Kingdom Pro Wrestling, to field the four-man tournament, with Yoji Anjo and Hiramitsu Kanahara joining Marcus Silvera and Tank Abbott to form the UFC Japan tournament. We've talked about Anjo in passing already, and while Kanahara would become one of the more successful Japanese MMA fighters in subsequent years, we won't be talking about him here because he would be injured in the build-up to the tournament, which necessitated a replacement by another Kingdom wrestler. This wrestler hasn't been mentioned in the story thus far because he genuinely has not mattered. But that night in December 1997, he would make himself matter. The man replacing Hiramitsu Kanahara was a wrestler of little regard named Kazushi Sakuraba. Kazushi Sakuraba's part in the story might start in 1997, but he's been part of it since at least the early 90s. Sporting a respectable amateur wrestling pedigree, Sakuraba joined UWFI's dojo because of his idolization of shoot-style icon Satoru Sayama, and while he was there, he would be molded from the bottom up by the school. It's overshadowed by the failures of Takata and Anjo as they fought Hicks and Gracie, but the UWFI dojo was certainly not slouching in the people brought in to train the students. With Kazushi Sakuraba and future Fighting Network ring star Kiyoshi Tomura being trained under catch wrestling icon Billy Robinson, Sakuraba's role in UWFI was very small as a newer trainee is customary in the world of Japanese wrestling. But Sakuraba's prowess slowly but surely began to pay off as he overcame initial losses to eventually work his way into a higher profile in the company. But before he could be promoted at the main event level, the UWFI was folded. When the roster migrated from UWFI to Kingdom without Takata, Sakuraba was placed prominently, winning many of his matches. But still, he wasn't picked to participate in the UFC Japan tournament, which more than likely had more to do with his size than anything else. As a wrestler, Kazushi Sakuraba was notably small, only weighing around 180 pounds, which actually meant that he was disqualified from even participating in the UFC tournament. But when Masanori Kanahara was injured, the story goes that Sakuraba reported that he was 203 pounds in order to fill in, meeting 240-pound Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt Marcus Silvera. While hokey stories about Sakuraba's weight can be laughed about now, this wouldn't even begin to cover how crazy the night would play out. The bout with Silvera is most known for Sakuraba getting stopped very quickly after eating a few punches and shooting for a takedown, leading to UFC referee Big John McCarthy believing that Sakuraba had been knocked out and calling a stop to the contest. Sakuraba and the crowd were incensed as they felt they'd been robbed, and Sakuraba, no joke, openly protested in the ring, attempting to get a microphone to address the crowd and refusing to leave the cage until things were made right. This is kind of what you get when you involve pro wrestlers in MMA spaces, and it's awesome. And also correct, as McCarthy reversed his decision and rendered the fight a no contest. But this still provided an issue, as Marcus Silvera still advanced to the finals to meet the winner of Tank Abbott and Yoji Anjo. Now, this fight between Abbott and Anjo certainly happened. I can't claim to have ever watched it because a 15-minute Tank Abbott fight seems like a poor investment in time, but Abbott would get the decision over Anjo while sustaining an injury making him unable to fight in the finals against Marcus Silvera. Silvera would now once again meet Kazushi Sakuraba in the tournament finals, with Sakuraba winning the rematch by armbar in three and a half minutes, famously declaring after the fight that professional wrestling is, in fact, strong. There is a lot to unpack from UFC Japan, and I want to start with that famous Sakuraba quote. Sakuraba is one of the few MMA fighters to ever achieve a level of success that wears his professional wrestling origins not just on his sleeve, but openly promotes it. And I think it's because the mindset he has is so wildly different to how many people view professional wrestling's relationship with MMA. You don't need this video to tell you that the history of crossovers between legitimate sports stars and professional wrestling is as old as wrestling itself. But the inverse, professional wrestlers entering legitimate sports, is less common to be generous. Legitimate sports stars entering wrestling always had the angle that they were highly trained in this specific art. So wrestling promoters would be burning money if they had someone like Salman Hashimikov, a Russian world champion wrestler, and promoted him as anything other than Salman Hashimikov, Russian world champion wrestler. But if a wrestler would cross over into another sport, none of them would want to be recognized as just a pro wrestler, because their pro wrestling base isn't what's going to get them success. Instead, it would be the years of dedicated training that they put in that they would want to be recognized. 
Obviously, it wasn't uncommon, especially in Japan, for wrestlers to achieve success in MMA, with Pancrase being the strongest competition in the sport and it being composed primarily by pro wrestlers. But the elite MMA fighters in the world, such as Ken Shamrock and Dan Severn, who also wrestled, never credited their pro wrestling history for their success. And really, why should they? Ken Shamrock wasn't a great fighter specifically because he was also a pro wrestler, just like Dan Severn wasn't a great fighter because he was NWA world champion. The two just didn't have anything to do with one another. Enter Kazushi Sakuraba, whose perspective on pro wrestling is decidedly different. Unlike Shamrock and Severn, Sakuraba entered professional wrestling being inspired by Satoru Sayama, whose influence over the original UWF was what pushed the company in the direction of shoot style and, after his self-imposed exile, would go on to create Shudo, the prototype of what would become mixed martial arts long before any other company would even be an idea. Sakuraba's pro wrestling training was just as much drilling catch wrestling with Billy Robinson and Kiyoshi Tomura as it was learning how to bump and make a match compelling. The skills he was taught in the UWFI dojo are a direct reason why he was able to succeed in the UFC tournament. So the idea that he should not credit his professional wrestling experience in his post-match speech seems silly. Really, Sakuraba's success in the UFC Japan tournament is the first step in the realization of Antonio Inoki's vision of strong style. Using professional wrestling, first and foremost, as a base for the promotion and advancement of martial arts. And though Sakuraba had won one of the weakest UFC tournaments to date, he did so outside of the controlled environments that Japanese shoot-style wrestlers had gained success in. While Pancrase was absolutely the best MMA company in the world in terms of competitive depth, the difference between Pancrase and the UFC led to them being almost entirely different sports. Let me put it this way. If MMA companies in the 90s were on a slider, with the left being professional wrestling and the right being unsanctioned Valley Tudo fights, with the middle being modern MMA, Pancrase would be somewhere between the middle and the left. Closer to the middle than anybody will give it credit for, but clearly leaning more towards pro wrestling than not. While the UFC, even in its sanitized state in 1997, still drifted much closer to unsanctioned Valet Tudo. There's no shame in admitting that Pancrase, while competitively far more dense, just didn't create an environment that would replicate the UFC, just like the UFC didn't create an environment that would replicate Pancrase. So the fighters that had fights in both Pancrase and the UFC would rarely see success in both. For example, Maurice Smith was a good kickboxer from the 1980s who floundered in Pancrase, but he was able to go to the UFC and won the UFC Heavyweight Championship, while Jason DeLucia was just some random guy on the first two UFC events who lost to Hoist Gracie, but transitioned to Pancrase and submitted Masakatsu Funaki in one minute, faster than anybody had ever done it before or since. There really was only one fighter who was great at both, and that was Ken Shamrock, who was a legend of the sport even by 1997. I bring all of this up to say that while pro wrestlers had been the best fighters in the world for much of its history thus far, very few of them were successful in environments that didn't feature other former pro wrestlers. So Kazushi Sakuraba achieving success in the UFC and crediting professional wrestling is a pretty monumental thing happening in both wrestling and MMA history. Following his UFC victory, Sakuraba ascended to a higher profile in Kingdom, but the company dwindled incredibly fast, closing down in early 1998. But that was okay because Kazushi Sakuraba's next stop would be his most significant. With Nobuhiko Takada and Hicks and Gracie's fight in pride garnering incredible success for KRS, the company chose to hold more events going forward, and with the collapse of Kingdom, it opened up the opportunity for Kazushi Sakuraba to once again enter the realm of mixed martial arts. Sakuraba's pride career started at Pride 2 when he was matched up across from Vernon Tiger White, a Pancrase veteran with a lopsided negative record. Despite the look of his record, Vernon White was a difficult fight for Sakuraba as his losses mostly came from fighting elite fighters like Funaki and Boss Rutan, and despite losing most of them, still had experience in MMA that Sakuraba simply didn't have. It's important to remember a few things when you enter into conversations about early MMA, especially in the 90s and especially in Japan. MMA advanced very quickly in the new millennium, but in the mid to late 90s, when the sport was evolving out of its general lawless early days, it was common to see fights boiled down to grappling matches that resulted in a lot of stalemates unless there was a significant skill discrepancy between the two fighters. In fact, Pancrase was really notable at the time for being a better product of the UFC because of a specific culture around their fights, which saw fighters who were grappling be more active in going for submissions and guard passes on the ground rather than a slower but safer style that some in the UFC were beginning to employ. This resulted in top fighters eating losses more frequently, but also fights being finished constantly, and all of the Pancrase fighters fighting six or seven times a year. Japan's attitude towards fighters losing is also really interesting in comparison to the West. 
Despite people believing they adore underdogs in America, the most popular fighters in boxing or mixed martial arts tend to be those who are the most successful. Whereas in Japan, there is much less disregarding people who lose as long as they put their entire heart into the performance. You could trace this back to the Bushido Code mentioned earlier in the video and the cultural significance of the honorable death and how that translates to sports. Or you could probably infer that the post-war image crisis that an entire generation of Japanese citizens went through manifested itself in believing that life's low moments are only significant if you let it get to you. So if fighters kept coming back after losing, it's valued more than simply the act of losing. You can project whichever you want onto this specific phenomenon regarding losses in MMA, but all of this is to say that Vernon White is a respected fighter for this era, and a good fight for Kazushi Sakuraba as he debuts in Pride. The fight with Vernon White is an entertaining one, and also an interesting one to talk about, as Sakuraba and White allegedly, either verbally or non-verbally agree to mostly scramble and go for risky plays in grappling rather than landing strikes on the ground. Which, there are a lot of ways to interpret that. It's been a long-standing rumor that Sakuraba's first two fights in Pride were either fixed or there was an agreement between Sakuraba and his opponent to primarily grapple, which led to Sakuraba's fights being notably entertaining on what turned out to be a really rocky start to Pride. I've not given my opinion much on things thus far, but if you ask me, an agreement between Sakuraba and his opponents in his first couple Pride fights to be primarily grappling-based isn't really that big of an issue. It's not like these were massive fights that were driving the company. They were low-end fights between grapplers who agreed to focus on grappling instead of punches. And even then, Sakuraba and his opponents did throw punches at each other. It's not like they were completely devoid of violence. But whether or not it's because of alleged agreements in the fights beforehand, Sakuraba's ability was able to shine through clear as day, picking up victories over Vernon White and Carlos Newton at Pride 2 and Pride 3. The fights were really good, and they really stood out in the scope of the first three Pride shows, which were bad. MMA in general was starting to enter a really weird dark age five years after its inception, and while there are a lot of reasons for this, very few of them are relevant to this story. But what is relevant is the fact that Pride sucking had Gracie fingerprints all over it. I went over Nobuhiko Takata vs. Hicks and Gracie as the genesis of Pride and lightly touched on Henzo Gracie, a cousin of the Elio line that featured Hickson and Hoist facing Akira Shoji in a spirited yet drawn-out fight on Pride's first show. But on Pride 2, the doubling down on Gracie's involvement was extremely present. First, there was a fight that featured an attempt to capture the magic that the Gracie family vs. UWFI veteran matchup had spawned at Pride 1 when Naoki Sano, a wrestler most known for his work with the legendary Jushin Thunder Liger in the late 80s, faced off against Hoyler Gracie. Since being passed over for participation in the first UFC event for his brother Hoist, Hoyler is one of the only high-profile Gracies to enter sport jiu-jitsu, utilizing his technical superiority to capture the 1996 and 1997 World Jiu-Jitsu Championships in the featherweight division and bronze in the 1997 Absolute division, only placing under Fabio Gergel and Amore Batetti, gold medal winners in divisions more than 30 kilograms above Hoyler. All of this is to say that Hoyler Gracie was absolutely one of the most accomplished grapplers in competitive Brazilian jiu-jitsu, where Naoki Sano was some guy who wrestled some shoot-style matches. I'll talk about this fight in a moment because I really need to explain the next one and what makes these so noteworthy. Henzo Gracie, who is markedly less accomplished than Hoyler in sport jiu-jitsu, but is also much more experienced in mixed martial arts, would face Sine Kakuda, a solid fighter for the time who was trained in shoot wrestling by Satoru Sayama, but failed to get involved in pro wrestling. The fight between Henzo and Kakuda was notable for its rule set, which followed the tradition set by the Gracies in Valet Tudo. Let me explain. Henzo's fight with Shoji at Pride 1 was 30 minutes long and ended in a draw, which the Gracies don't love because it lacks finality. I've gone over how the Gracies are unafraid of making a fight last forever if it means that they will get a submission by way of attrition. But with mixed martial arts becoming more modernized, the implementation of time limits really hampered their ability to do that. Up to this point in history, the longest mixed martial arts fight of all time happened at UFC 5 in the rematch between Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie. It was the first UFC event to feature time limits, and consequentially, the fight between Hoist and Ken was the first to reach a time limit, going to 30 minutes with no decisive winner. So the UFC, on the spot, decided to arbitrarily continue the fight for an additional 6 minutes to try and get one, and ultimately, they failed. No UFC fight before or since has been longer than 36 minutes, and through all of my research, I can't find a single instance of a fight in any company going longer. If I'm wrong, which I could be, then please let me know. But I really do believe that 30 minutes is about the cap that the general world decided upon for MMA fights. 
This didn't sit well with the Gracies, who didn't get the finish in Henzo's fight against Shoji at Pride 1 with a 30-minute time limit. So for Pride 2, negotiations were pretty clearly had that eradicated time limits for at least the Gracie fights. Hoyler and Sano, despite Hoyler Gracie's technical prowess, went to mind-melting 33 minutes before Hoyler picked up a submission. Good for at least the second longest MMA fight of all time, if my research is correct. It's a little long, but fine. Okay, no big deal. Henzo Gracie is facing another catch wrestler, and maybe this will go better. No. No, that can't be right. I cannot be reading that right. Henzo Gracie and Sineke Kuda did not fight for over 50 minutes. That's just... That isn't real. Nope. Apparently it's real. Henzo Gracie had negotiated that the fight would last an unlimited number of 10-minute rounds, which... That is too long to fight and not be at all interesting. And trust me, it's not. The Gracies having their hand in Pride's early shows really made these shows suck tremendously because of the core values of the Gracie family and their style. Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, as stated before, is not made to be a spectator event. It's made to be a self-defense system that was adapted to Anything Goes Combat. But part of the value of Anything Goes is that while you could get a violent, bombastic knockout, you can also stall a fight out and implement your game effectively, no matter how boring it is to watch. The Gracies copied and pasted their style onto a spectator sport in MMA, and brought with them all of the positives and negatives their style brings. It's methodical, it's effective, and it sucks to watch. Kazushi Sakuraba's fights in the first two Pride shows really are two of the only highlights on the shows, specifically because of the culture he brought with him that meshed perfectly with Vernon White and Carlos Newton's outlooks on the sport. They wanted action, they wanted scrambles, they wanted risky plays that are fun to watch. That being said, not everything would go this way for Kazushi Sakuraba. Eventually, he would run into someone who wasn't willing to play nice. Someone who wasn't willing to scramble with him. And when that happened, we would see what Sakuraba was really made of. Pride 4 at the end of 1997 was a big event for multiple reasons. To start, the company returned to the Tokyo Dome as the headliner was a rematch between Hicks and Gracie and Nobuhiko Takata on the anniversary of Pride 1. It was the debut of promotional stalwart Igor Vochanchin. Many of the fighters previously featured, such as Akira Shoji and Alexander Otsuka, got big wins over highly touted opponents, but it also featured a fight between Kazushi Sakuraba and Alan Goes. Goes was a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu black belt trained by Carlson Gracie with a particular nasty streak that was befitting of his Gracie lineage. Goes debuted at MMA against Frank Shamrock, who would go on to become one of the best pound-for-pound fighters in the world. With the fight being extremely close, but Goes would gouge Shamrock's eyes to set up submissions, as well as refusing to let go of chokes when ordered to. Suffice it to say, Goes was a mean bastard, but an incredibly talented grappler to be across from Sakuraba at this stage of his career. It's unknown if Sakuraba approached Vernon White and Carlos Newton to pitch to them the style of their fights, or if it was just an understanding between the two parties. But much like the dynamic between Takata and Hickson, should Sakuraba have pitched to Goes the idea of heavy grappling, there is almost no chance that Goes would accept. Because, why would he? Goes was an accomplished and well-trained jiu-jitsu ace, and gained nothing from scrambling with a catch wrestler. If Sakuraba couldn't beat him on the ground, that was no problem with him. Again, I don't want to insinuate that Sakuraba was trying to orchestrate a fight that would be unbecoming of sports, but more trying to illustrate that Sakuraba's pride career thus far had been exciting and successful, but there was a pretty clear difference between how Newton and White fought and how Goes would fight, with Newton and Goes being more willing to engage with the dynamic Sakuraba, and Alan Goes being a Gracie black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It would certainly be the biggest test of Sakuraba's career, and one that I'm not fully sure he passed. Sakuraba didn't lose the fight with Goes, but he definitely didn't win it either. The fight went to a draw after 30 minutes, the longest fight either of them have had in their short MMA careers up to this point, with the fight primarily taking place in this position. Alan Goes laying on his back, Sakuraba standing above him, almost at a loss at what to do. Whenever Sakuraba engaged Goes on the ground, he was put in bad positions, threatened with strikes and submissions, and just generally outskilled in every capacity. But Goes also held a size advantage over Sakuraba, who wasn't a very talented striker, so the stalemate just had time to sit and linger in the air. After the fight ended, it looked like Sakuraba had been completely solved. If you don't go for big exchanges with him on the ground, his actual technical prowess was sorely lacking. 
And while this reaction may be too harsh, as Goes was an extremely experienced black belt who would go on to become one of the most influential fighters in Brazil, starting Brazilian top team alongside fellow Carlson Gracie black belts Mario Sperry, Marilla Bustamante, and Ricardo Laborio, it was impossible to deny that Sakuraba had looked listless against Goes. In the main event of that show, Nobuhiko Takata put on a much better performance against Hickson than he had the year prior, dropping him with a knee in the clinch and initiating a lot of scrambles with aggressive leg lock attempts. But ultimately, he was beaten once again by the legendary Gracie champion. Pride had been somewhat successful in 1998, but while Takata was able to salvage something of his reputation after the rematch with Hickson, it was clear that he was never going to be the star that Pride needed him to be. MMA in the late 90s was experiencing massive trouble, with every company under the sun experiencing deep money problems. And with the Gracie domination of Pride and the complete snuffing out of all of the top Japanese fighters in the first year of operation, it would take something truly special to pull Pride out from the nosedive that they were almost destined for. At Pride's next event in April 1999, Sakuraba continued his career progression by facing Vitor Belfort. Now, Belfort is one of those super talents you hear about at movies, but you don't expect to actually see in real life. Nicknamed the Phenom, Belfort had been fighting in MMA for three years with a 6-1 record, winning the 1997 UFC 12 tournament at 19 years old and finishing five of his six fights by knockout, often winning within the first minute of competition. On top of his explosive knockout power and blinding speed, Vitor Belfort's background is in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Carlson Gracie. Belfort was bigger than Sakuraba, stronger than Sakuraba, had the grappling pedigree that flustered Sakuraba when he fought Alan Goes, and beyond that, Sakuraba had yet to face someone with the ability to hurt him with punches that Belfort brought to the table. The fight itself is iconic, because what Vitor Belfort was good at was exactly what came to pass. He blitzed Sakuraba with punches, seemed to hurt him, and flirted on him hard, and didn't finish him. That was kind of new for Vitor. Again, Vitor's longest fight he won by knockout was a minute and 17 seconds long, and in his lone submission win, it only went 4 minutes. It was firmly established that Vitor had the ability to destroy people at an instant, but when he flurried on Sakuraba, the professional wrestler endured. Be it because he is emboldened by some fabled Bushido code that is instilled deep in the Japanese spirit, or because he is just really mentally tough from years in the Japanese dojo systems, but Sakuraba endured the punishment and unveiled his secret weapon. Sakuraba had learned how to strike. Kazushi Sakuraba recognized that his flaw in the Goes fight was entirely built around a lack of ability to punish Goes for inactivity on his back and at neutral positions on the feet, resolving to address that flaw coming into his next fight with Vitor Belfort, where he primarily utilized kicks to chop the legs and body of the Phenom down. Most of this fight once again takes place with Belfort on his back and Sakuraba standing over the jiu-jitsu player, but unlike against Goes, Sakuraba punished Belfort with a constant stream of leg kicks for as long as he remained in that position. But outside of this, the fight also saw Sakuraba landing many heavy kicks on the feet, my favorite of which is a spinning back kick to Vitor's body that hurts him badly, forcing Vitor to drop down to his back after having just gotten up from the position where he had eaten dozens of kicks already. It's one of the most uniquely embarrassing performances in MMA history because Sakuraba's rudimentary kicking game combined with his patience and willingness to make fun of his opponents taunting Belfort on the ground and going for silly guard passes. It wouldn't surprise me if Sakuraba never trained the spinning back kick at all, but just threw it as a goof and it happened to hurt Vitor badly enough that it was just accepted as a position. While Sakuraba wasn't the first person to beat a Gracie black belt in Pride, Akira Shoji had just gotten a win over Valid Ishmael at Pride 4. He was uniquely positioned in the company after Pride 5. While Akira Shoji had clearly had the most success against Gracie fighters, he was still outskilled by Henzo Gracie, though the fight was declared a draw. Whereas Kazushi Sakuraba, while clearly outskilled by Alan Goes, had never been provably outwitted by a Gracie directly, embarrassing and defeating a Gracie black belt in the process. I don't know if the Gracie family were any kind of centralized brain trust or if they were floating through the world unattached to one another, but Sakuraba's fights against Goes and Vitor had been back-to-back -back performances where Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was unable to secure a victory over a Japanese fighter which had to rub the Gracies the wrong way. Remember, the Gracies have dominated Japan since Masahiko Kimura beat Elio Gracie in 1951. No Japanese fighter has beaten a Gracie since that night, and in the world of mixed martial arts, the Gracies have never lost, with their biggest domain of sustained dominance being Japan. The existence of Kazushi Sakuraba as a foil to the efficacy of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was something that could not stand. He needed to be destroyed if Gracie influence was to remain paramount. So at Pride 8, November 21st, 1999, 
they would get that chance, as Kazushi Sakuraba would be matched up against the Gracie family's technical ace, Hoyler Gracie. The fight between Sakuraba and Hoyler is a special one. It's the first fight that I can find in MMA history to be almost entirely fought under Gracie rules. Though I believe there was a time limit to the bout, there would be no judges to render a decision as had been becoming the standard across MMA. Additionally, the referee was only permitted to stop the fight due to knockout or submission. There would be no stand-ups or separations due to inactivity. This was, for all intents and purposes, the Gracie Challenge in mixed martial arts. The specific matchup between Hoyler and Sakuraba was interesting as well because even this early in his career, Sakuraba was notable for fighting with a size disadvantage but the fight with Hoyler was the first where it was Sakuraba who would have the size advantage, weighing in at over 30 pounds heavier than Hoyler. But, come on. This is a story we've heard a million times. Hoyler Gracie is one of the most accomplished grapplers in the world. He's competed at the highest levels of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and represents the Gracie family and their hallowed rule set against yet another one of these Japanese professional wrestlers. Something had to give. And if it wasn't going to be Kazushi Sakuraba, then it would have to be Hoyler Gracie. Because now he's pushing the leg against his own leg. You see, he cannot go any further. Right. Okay, the referee has moved in. The referee is waiting the fight off. The referee has stopped the fight. Wow, yeah, I, 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 in Hoyler's defense, I don't know. Well, Hoyler's looking, wait a minute. The referee has stopped the fight. Oh, I think we're going to have a controversy here. Mr. Easter from K1 looking on. Kazushi Sakuraba has been awarded the victory by referee stoppage. Hoyler, Hoyler lost the fight for sure and got stopped. And he's saying, I didn't tap. But nonetheless, Kazushi Sakuraba gets the victory. Hickson is protesting. There seems to be a controversy. What you're hearing is a muted reaction to history. Unlike what you've seen in movies, history being made doesn't always come with thunderous sound bites and bombastic celebration. It's often confusing, and people don't really know how to process what happened. So let me paint a picture. In the fight between Sakuraba and Hoyler Gracie, Sakuraba absolutely embarrassed Hoyler. It wasn't a contest. Sakuraba used his superior size and strength to dominate the smaller Brazilian hurting him on the feet and assuming the very familiar position of standing over Hoyler as Hoyler begged Sakuraba to jump into his guard while Sakuraba kicked his legs repeatedly. Occasionally, Sakuraba would engage in the good old-fashioned bad manners, taunting Hoyler while Hoyler laid on his back and begged him to engage. But even when Sakuraba did engage, Hoyler had no answers for that either. There was no debate. Hoyler Gracie, the technical genius of the Gracie family, was thoroughly outgunned in the fight against Sakuraba. The fight came to an end in the third round, when Sakuraba assumed top control on Hoyler and, in a moment of divine intervention, was able to snag Hoyler's arm in a deep submission. The name of the submission depends on which discipline you practice. In judo, the move is called the Udegarami. In catch wrestling, it's called the double wrist lock. But today, in modern Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's simply called the Kimura. Kazushi Sakuraba locked Hoyler Gracie in the Kimura and wrenched it behind his back. Not with malice, but with intent. For Hoyler's part, he didn't react, keeping a straight face as Sakuraba threatened to snap his arm. But as the position worsened, the referee stepped in to prevent injury. Only, Hoyler never actually tapped. Hoyler protested. Hickson, who was in Hoyler's corner, protested. Sakuraba seemed unsatisfied in the corner, but none of that mattered to the audience packed inside Ariake Coliseum. The audience in attendance couldn't have cared less about Hoyler Gracie never tapping or the controversial nature to it. They had just seen Kazushi Sakuraba, a Japanese professional wrestler, become the first person in mixed martial arts history to beat a Gracie, with the circumstances being eerily similar to Masahiko Kimura's victory over Elio Gracie in 1951. This should be remembered as a landmark in MMA history, but the circumstances just don't allow for it. First, despite the stoppage coming, it was incredibly controversial, as Hoyler's arm was not broken, nor did he tap or scream in pain. Second, Hoyler was much smaller than Sakuraba, despite that being what the Gracie family wanted to emphasize their jiu-jitsu, but whatever. Despite Sakuraba getting the victory, the feeling that the Gracies had an indomitable hole on MMA was still unshaken. No, to challenge that, Sakuraba would have to challenge one of their titans, and he would have to do it in a way that was undeniable. 
Sakuraba's victory over Hoyler Gracie would necessitate a sleeping giant to deal with him. Sakuraba would have to fight Hoist Gracie. I haven't talked in depth about Hoist because Hoist's story takes place beyond the Vale of Japan. Hoist Gracie, prior to 1993, was mostly known as the baby of the family, with Hoist being the youngest of Elio Gracie's sons to move to America. Alongside Hickson and Hoyler, Hoist would continue the tradition of the Gracie Challenge, where they would face other martial artists in Fale Tudo matches to prove jiu-jitsu's superiority. But Horian, who was the marketing genius of the family, orchestrated a tournament to promote the art to the masses. The ultimate fighting championship was where Hoist Gracie carved his name into stone, with Hoist running through the tournament with relative ease and seemingly proving the superiority of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu over all other martial arts. In the process of winning, Hoist Gracie would beat Ken Shamrock, who, even early on, had marked himself as the best MMA fighter in the world during his time in Pancrase. And with Hoist beating him with relative ease, it's hard to dispute Hoist as the best fighter in the world. Even when Hicks and Gracie entered the fray and won the Valley Tudo Japan tournament in 1994, it was surpassed by Hoist Gracie's dominance in America, winning the tournaments at UFC 2 and UFC 4, only faltering in UFC 3 because he pulled out due to injury. Hoist Gracie was the most proven winner in MMA at the time. Even if he wasn't considered the best Gracie by the Gracies, to the rest of the world who saw the UFC tournaments, he was next to unbeatable. Boiling in the background of these initial UFC tournaments, though, was the anticipation for another match between Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie, as Shamrock in 1994 was arguably having an even better year than Hoist. But because Hoist had beaten him when he was unprepared, he had a demon hanging over his achievements that he was desperate to overcome. Shamrock wanted to enter the UFC 2 tournament, but an injury forced him to watch Hoist Gracie once again sweep the tournament from the audience. A UFC 3, Ken Shamrock entered, but a Hoist Gracie injury forced him out, which meant that Shamrock pulled out as well as he was only here to face Hoist Gracie. Ken Shamrock wouldn't enter or attend UFC 4 to see Hoist win a third tournament, but instead he would be in Japan, winning the King of Pancrase tournament on the same day. Hoist Gracie and Ken Shamrock were unquestionably the top two fighters in the world, and the world needed to see them clash in a veritable super fight. And they would, at UFC 5 in the first ever UFC fight to be booked outside of the tournament format. The fight itself I've spoken about. It was the longest fight in UFC history, but it was also the first to ever have a time limit, ruling the fight a draw after a year of anticipation. Following the event, the Gracie family were furious. Horian had helped create the company to sped Gracie Jiu-Jitsu dogma, and part of that was the intrinsic value of a lack of time limits to hinder the progression of their art. The way the Gracies viewed things, they were not trying to facilitate a sport. Sports had rules, and sports need to make money, but the Gracies wanted to facilitate superiority. And if that means that they had to fight someone for three hours while slowly sinking in a choke, then that's what that means. With the UFC being on pay-per-view, they had strict time limits they had to adhere to, so running a potential hours-long fight just wasn't feasible. So the Gracies pulled out of the UFC entirely in early 1995. It's probably not a coincidence that, two years later, the Gracies would begin cropping up in Japan with the advent of pride who were much more willing to allow the Gracies to have hours-long matches if they went that long. See Henzo vs. Kakuda and Hoyler vs. Sano. Pride was in a place where they needed the popularity of the Gracies to survive, as they didn't have a Japanese star of their own, partially because Hicks and Gracie had demolished Nobuhiko Takata. For Hoist, though, he had semi-retired after UFC 5. He was supposed to compete at Pride in 1998, signing to fight Mark Kerr in a fight with, again, no time limit but pulled out due to an injury and never flirted with competition again. And then Sakuraba beat Hoyler at Pride 8. Hoist Gracie had been on the sideline while his family was losing in the organization that they were meant to be dominating. The mystique of the Gracie family was beginning to get scuffed, if not outright be questioned, which is something that just couldn't be tolerated. Hoist Gracie would come out of retirement, and he would have his eyes set on Kazushi Sakuraba. On May 1st, 2000, Kazushi Sakuraba and Hoist Gracie entered the ring. The stage was Pride Fighting Championships, the largest mixed martial arts organization in the world, but the rules of their fight couldn't be further from mixed martial arts. Sure, they're fighting in an MMA ring, wearing MMA gloves, and whoever wins will have it reflected on their MMA record, but on this night, Kazushi Sakuraba and Hoist Gracie are slotted for a fight to the death. To avoid the controversy that gave Sakuraba the win over Hoyler Gracie, Hoist negotiated for special rules. No time limits. No referee interference. Just Sakuraba and Hoist doing battle in perpetuity until one of them is unconscious 
taps out, or their corner throws in the towel. The referee is only there to signal the end of the match. Otherwise, he is not allowed to intervene. These are the hallowed Gracie rules, and a stage that would test the endurance of Kazushi Sakuraba as much as his ability. The format of the fight would see Sakuraba and Gracie fight for 15 minutes at the time, with the rounds having no cap, necessitating a finish. While the rules were not strictly to the death, this fight is the closest mixed martial arts has come to blood sport. It's an event with decades of history going into it, going back to Kano Jigoro fracturing traditional martial arts, to Misuyo Maeda passing Jigoro's judo to the Gracies in Brazil, to the national identity of Japan being salvaged by traditional Masahiko Kimura and forward-thinking Ricky Dozen, from the lineage of Antonio Inoki to Nobuhiko Takada, from professional wrestling's reckoning with the surge of true combat, from the depths of Brazilian challenges to the grandest stage in the Tokyo Dome, Kazushi Sakuraba, a charming upstart carrying the Japanese flag into war, faces off against the undefeated phenom Hoist Gracie, the chosen representative of the Gracie family. The winner would dictate the future of martial arts forever. It's not just about these two. It was always more than just them. Gracie and Sakuraba meet in the ring and go to work, the slow and methodical work befitting the Gracie style. Because of the rule set, Kazushi Sakuraba would allow Gracie to get his back, wrap up an arm, and stick his head outside of the ropes as they were on the feet. Knowing the referee could not separate them, but frustrating Hoist Gracie because it was an abject stalemate. Gracie would attempt to punch Sakuraba from this position, but to no avail. When they were in neutral space, the lanky Gracie would attempt to grapple Sakuraba, but Sakuraba would either shuck it off or, on the rare occasions he did engage, he would take advantage of Hoist Gracie's gi to compromise his position. The gi in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a tradition carried on from Judo, and has long been the advantage over those who did not wear them. In competition, Hoist Gracie used the gi to surprise Ken Shamrock in his victory at UFC 1, but culturally, it's a symbol of the status that the Gracie family held, both in mixed martial arts and out. It's a uniform for supremacy. But as Sakuraba both figuratively and literally stripped Hoist Gracie down using the same gi, it would become incredibly obvious. The gi is stupid to fight in. If the jiu-jitsu practitioner used the gi to grab onto for leverage and gain advantageous positions, couldn't the opponent also hold on to it to compromise their position? No one had ever asked this question before, but on that night, Sakuraba simply held the gi and punched Hoist as if it were hockey, and Hoist had literally no answers. Every time they would get into an exchange, Sakuraba would either come out on top or he would cause a stalemate, which meant that the minutes continued to count past and the rounds would end, with Hoist Gracie not doing any work to exhaust the pro wrestler. 15-minute round after 15-minute round passed, with Sakuraba continuing his assault on tradition. And the most amazing thing began happening. Hoist Gracie, who wanted the fight to last forever if it meant that he could gain victory, was getting tired. Maybe it was from the constant work he was doing to try to break a stalemate. Maybe it was from the constant kicks and punches Sakuraba was landing on him. But as the fight crossed the mark for the longest MMA fight in history by the end of the fourth round, signifying a full hour of fighting, it was clear that Hoist Gracie was diminishing. There would be no long, drawn-out breaths or begging for air. Gracie was simply running on fumes that he just couldn't sustain himself with. As Gracie tired, Sakuraba began dominating even more, landing kicks to Hoist's legs, which kept Hoist in, once again, the famous position for Sakuraba. This position had to become a deep mark of shame for jiu-jitsu black belts, because, trust me, people began noticing that if the black belts are kept on their back and begging you to exchange with them, if you just don't, what are they going to do? What could Hoist Gracie possibly do to make Sakuraba engage with him on the ground? As the fight wore on, Elio Gracie, the patriarch of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, sat ringside and watched as Sakuraba undress the greatest fighter in the sport's history for the entire world to see. This wasn't just a beating in front of God and man. It was a systematic dismantling of the Gracie family and their famed mystique. And with each minute that passed by the Gracie's demand, their most successful champion in this sport was eating more and more damage. I can't speak for Elio Gracie as a participant in sports. I can't speak for him as a man. But on this night in 2000, Elio Gracie spoke for himself as a father. Sakuraba and Hoist had fought for six rounds, and if each are 15 minutes, that would mean that these men had fought for 90 minutes. And Elio Gracie had seen enough. He knew that, like himself against Masahiko Kimura 50 years prior, Hoist Gracie would rather die in the ring than admit someone was better than him. So Elio made the call. Elio Gracie threw in the towel to protect Hoist from himself, giving Kasuji Sakuraba the victory over Hoist Gracie. This time, there was no confusion. There were no protests because there couldn't be.
The referee didn't screw Hoist. The company didn't screw Hoist. Nobody screwed Hoist. The rules that Hoist had specifically requested either forced his corner to call off the fight or watch Hoist die. If you look into history with the benefit of hindsight, you'd think that this was inevitable. The Gracie family had been under attack since Falid Ishmael was challenging the Gracies in jiu-jitsu in 1998. Sakuraba beat Hoyler Gracie in 1999, and Kiyoshi Tamura, a pro wrestler with the same catch wrestling roots as Sakuraba, bested Henzo Gracie in rings in February 2000. The writing was on the wall. The age of the Gracies in mixed martial arts was over, so you may think that this victory for Sakuraba was just always going to happen. And maybe you're right, but you would be underplaying the significance of this fight. Even during the year 2000, martial arts was still very much viewed as a kind of ancient secret. You hear stories about Tibetan monks going years without moving through nothing but the sheer dedication to their lifestyle. You'd see videos of a karate master breaking 12 cinder blocks with a single punch. Pressure point specialists who could stop your heart from beating with a single blow. In the decade of the 90s, martial arts was the last refuge of mysticism in an increasingly cynical society. While overly indulgent music and wholesome sitcoms were forced out of the cultural zeitgeist in favor of alternative programming like The Simpsons or grunge music like Nirvana, the allure and mystery of traditional martial arts remained. As MMA became more popular, it was arguably the Gracies who kept this true. Because even though the rise of MMA revealed to the world that nobody had any idea about what fighting truly looked like, the best competitors in this new medium that followed in line with the counterculture of the 90s were bastions of tradition. It was a small man in a traditional gi who, with the use of hidden techniques, could choke out a man twice his size as he had secret knowledge that nobody could ever understand. And even though losses had begun to accumulate for the Gracies, Hoist Gracie was still the greatest fighter who'd ever competed in the UFC. He had never lost an MMA fight and only left the sport because he couldn't fight the way he wanted to, being done in by the sanitization of rules and sports. But against Kazushi Sakuraba, a man who openly represented the fake art of professional wrestling, he brought with him all of the mystical secrets that previous generations had built up. He brought with him a rule set with which to work his magical art, and across the longest fight in MMA history, he was proven to be just a man. Martial arts weren't proven irrelevant, but the mysticism and the fantasy was. The last pillar of mystery in the world of sports was revealed not as a god, not as an unsolvable riddle, but just a man behind the curtain. The Gracies had been losing, but it wasn't until May 1st, 2000 that they were proven mortal. It took 90 minutes, the length of time it takes a family to go and see a movie, for Sakuraba to unseat thousands of years of ancient secrets and prove that we are all just human. Sakuraba's legacy is not solely this fight, but his legacy was never that of an undefeated god who would be undefeated for the rest of time. In fact, he didn't even leave May 1st without a loss, as he would fight later that night against number one fighter in the world, Igor Vovchanchin, for an additional 15 minutes before his corner threw in the towel after an impossible 105 minutes of fighting in one night. But Sakuraba's legacy holds up not as a myth, but as a man. Sakuraba would become known for fighting against impossible odds, facing off against fighters who would go on to be titans in MMA, like Vanderlei Silva and Mirko Krokop, losing to them but continuing to fight anyways. He was human, and humans age. They get hurt, they experience loss, and eventually, they die. But Kazushi Sakuraba is emblematic of the endurance of humanity. That we will all experience hard times, but the important thing to do is to get back up and continue the fight. In Japanese mixed martial arts, there have been people more popular than Kazushi Sakuraba. There have been people who have been better sportsmen than Kazushi Sakuraba. But it can be argued that in not just Japan, but in all of MMA, there has never been anybody more important. Because Kazushi Sakuraba embodies what is great about the sport. MMA fighters are not fantasy characters. They are human. They feel pain. They grow old and they die. Which makes the things that they're able to do while they're able to do them all the more special. Kazuchi Sakuraba changed the world on May 1st, 2000. He stripped away the last visage of mystique left in sports and, in doing so, ushered mixed martial arts into its modern age. An age beyond the vice grip of the Gracie family and an age that could advance beyond them faster than anybody could have ever dreamed. Nobody is like Kazuchi Sakuraba. Nobody ever will be again because what made Sakuraba special doesn't exist anymore and because of Sakuraba, it never will. Sakuraba, like all of us, will grow old and die one day, but his impact will be felt forever. So for that, 
Long live Kazushi Sakuraba, the Gracie Hunter, the IQ wrestler, the most important fighter of all time.